Good morning, everyone. I'm Brandon Fess with the Local History and Genealogy Division at the Rochester Public Library. Welcome to today's presentation of Morning in the Morning. Please remember to join us next month on November 12th for Frederick and Anna Douglas, The Family Life of a Very Public Man in the 1800s, presented by Rose O'Keefe. Today's presentation is History in Plain Sight, Architects, Architecture, and Mount Hope Cemetery. There is no aspect of American history that can't be interpreted through Mount Hope Cemetery, and that is especially so with the architects and architectural history of Rochester and the surrounding region. Architecture is the art we see every day, and Mount Hope is a veritable museum of architecture with its own collection of significant buildings and monuments. It is also the final resting place of the architects, builders, and important clients who determine the built environment of our area. Our presenter today is Dennis Carr. Dennis Carr is a founding member, past president, and current vice president of the Friends of Mount Hope Cemetery. He's the senior tour guide at Mount Hope, with 2022 marking his 44th year leading tours of Mount Hope Cemetery. Carr is also on staff at the Edward G. Minor Library at the University of Rochester Medical Center, assisting students, researchers, clinical staff, and faculty. He is a lifelong scholar of the American Cemetery. Ladies and gentlemen, Dennis Carr. Well, hello. And uh, uh, architecture is, is a special interest of mine. And uh, um, the, the, the cemetery is a, is a great place to study architecture. You know, uh, the monuments are in individual architectural styles and they range from the very earliest uh, in the 1830s in styles that were, were popular in the late 18th and, and early 19th century up to pretty much uh, the present day when we see uh, uh, monuments and, uh, and a few mausoleums in, in, in relatively uh, uh, modern styles that, that are basically our throwback to uh, some of the revival styles, but, but done in an updated way. And uh, uh, many of the architects that built Rochester, most of the architects that built Rochester and this region uh, are buried in the cemetery or have done commissions uh, within the cemetery or their important clients are buried in the cemetery. So, so the link between architecture and architects and Mount Hope is a strong one. And, uh, and just a little bit about the, uh, the architectural profession in general. Um, it, like all the professions uh, in the 19th century, um, there, there wasn't necessarily a, a college curriculum that, uh, that you would uh, uh, take to become an architect. And uh, in the case of architecture, you generally uh, would uh, apprentice under a, an ex a more experienced architect. And in the early part of the 19th century, we really didn't have uh, academically trained architects at all. We had what were referred to as uh, builder architects. Uh, the most famous uh, builder architect uh, in the United States was Samuel McIntyre in Salem, Massachusetts in the uh, latter eight, 18th century. And he designed houses in a, a, a uh, a very competent uh, federal style. And he's always always uh, used as the example of this, this model of the builder architect. And uh, in Rochester, uh, one of the builder architects th that worked extensively in Rochester was Alfred Mason Badger. And uh, um, Alfred Mason Badger uh, was, you know, in, in, in his day, uh, his clients, uh, would have expected that he not only designed the, their house or their building, but that he also um, executed the project. So uh, these these people were were architects as well as builders, but they but you know uh, they they were more builder than architect, but they were talented um, um, designers. In the case of uh, Alfred Mason Badger, uh, one of his most important commissions was the Silas O. Smith House on East Avenue, Woodside, at the corner of East Avenue and Sibley Place in, in, in the Greek Revival style. And uh, um, uh, he came to Rochester in the 1830s, early 1830s, and uh, um, he was a carpenter and a builder and 
um, sort of advertise himself as as a, a, a as an architect. And, and probably in most of his advertising, he didn't really use the word architect, but, uh, but he would design houses. And uh, if you're familiar with East Avenue, uh, there, there's, uh, there is Woodside. For many years, the uh, uh, home of the Rochester Historical so Society. And uh, these are, are drawings that were made in 1934 as part of the Historic American Buildings Survey uh, during the Depression. And, uh, um, and, and we, have, we have these drawings for many of the uh, uh, important uh, buildings in Rochester that were you know, from the 19th century and before. There's a side view of uh, Woodside um, um, showing you the uh, windows and the, the porches and, and, the, and the cupola at the top and what they're, what they're made of. Uh, here's the interior floor plan for, for Woodside. And uh, you should note, uh, uh, over on the on the left, uh, the the downstairs, the first floor plan. Um, long before anybody talked about open concept um, uh, residences, uh, uh, these builder architects they 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 had a method for that in in the 1830s. If you look on the uh, on the floor plan, you know, on the on the right hand side, the sitting room and the parlor. They have uh, pocket doors that, that separate those rooms. So you could have that open space or you could close it up and have two separate rooms. And you'll see that in uh, um, a lot of houses of that uh, vintage. Uh, the Hervey Ely House, the home of the DAR, has a similar setup. Um, um, Warner Castle across the, across the street from, uh, from the cemetery has pocket doors that, that separate the the, the basically the two parlors. And uh, there's a more recent picture of, uh, of Woodside. But uh, Woodside's important. And uh, um, if you are interested in, in architectural history and you happen to look at uh, books dealing with architectural history, you'll find that Woodside is often cited as, as the premier example of, of the Greek revival, not just here in Rochester, but, uh, but everywhere. And uh, you'll see the you'll see pictures of Woodside in in architectural textbooks and uh, uh, style guides and things like that. So uh, an important an important uh, building in in Rochester. Uh, there's an interior shot of uh, the staircase at Woodside, and uh, um, you can see the pilasters up along the walls are are uh, uh, you know, have these. Uh, 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 looks like Corinthian. Um, uh, they're uh, uh, of the architectural style of the day, and and the architect you know, Alfred, Alfred Mason Badger uh, designed the interior as well. And uh, you can see that he was a uh, uh, whether he called himself an architect or not, he was a very competent designer. Um, Another of the builder architects is uh, Nehemiah Osborne. And uh, Nehemiah Osborne, uh, his own house was at the corner of East Main and uh, East Avenue, or right about where the, uh, I believe it's the Bank of America is today. And uh, you can see it's in this, once again, in the Greek Revival style. And uh, uh, Nehemiah Osborne was a very early um, adopter of photography. And so uh, he, he often took pictures of his, uh, his architecture, but he, he many times would, would insert himself into the picture, as you can see in this one. That's Nehemiah Osborne standing in front of his house, having his picture taken with the, uh, with the building. Um, he was also the designer and the owner of, of a hotel called the Osborne House Hotel. It used to sit at the corner of Main Street and St. Paul. And, and there actually is a picture of, of, of the Osborne House, um, uh, very much like this one. Uh, and, and with, with uh, Nehemiah Osborne standing on one of, one of those uh, wrought iron um, porches, or one of those wrought iron uh, um, terraces out there on, on the edge of the house. Uh, this became part of Lindsay, uh, um, Sibley Lindsay and Kerr, they bought the Osborne House after after it was moved to a bigger building on South Avenue, 
and it became part of their store. Sibley, Lindsay and Kerr began in a, in a building on West Main Street, uh, sort of adjacent to the Osborne House um, and expanded into several buildings. They eventually took over the Osborne House and the building behind it as part of their, their operation. And um, later on, 18, 1893, 1894, they built the Granite Building to house, to house their, their uh, department store. But, uh, but they, were part, they occupied the Osborne House Hotel. There it is. Um, Merwin Austin is really probably the first person in Rochester to, uh, uh, to uh, advertise himself as an architect. Uh, Nehemiah Osborne, uh, he, in the city directories over the years, he first advertised himself as a carpenter, then as a contractor, then as a builder. It's only in, only in the year 1841 that Nehemiah Osborne uh, listed himself in the city directory as an architect. In 1842, he goes back to build it. So maybe there wasn't as much money in just being an architect as there was in, in being a builder. So he, he, he goes back to that, that idea of being a builder. Merwin Austin, um, who came to Rochester in the 1840s, he is the first one in Rochester to really advertise himself as an architect. And, and he built a lot of high profile projects. The second Monroe County Courthouse, uh, this sits right on, uh, back a little bit, but right on, on Main Street, right where the, uh, right where the current uh, Monroe County office building sits. Um, he built the Plymouth Congregational Church at the corner of Plymouth Avenue and Troop Street in, in a, a, a sort of stylized Gothic revival in 1855. He was the architect of record for the uh, Warner Castle directly across the street from us uh, on Mount Hope Avenue. Warner Castle was a home of, of uh, H.G. Warner, who was a, a, he was a judge, he was an editor and, uh, um, and a writer. And, and he was also a very accomplished artist. Uh, Merwin Austin's brother was, uh, was killed in 1849. He was in the military. He he led uh, he led a troop that, that was exploring the, uh, uh, the the Western territories, and uh, he was his, his uh, regiment was was ambushed by Native Americans, and and um, Warner's brother was killed. So Warner went to uh, he went to California, and when he in, in 1849 and 50, and he he would send these very accomplished drawings back to his, his family in Rochester to describe what he was seeing there. And uh, in 18, early in 1855, H.G. Uh, um, uh, Warner, not related to Andrew Warner, H.G. Warner, he, he spent some time in Scotland. And in Scotland, he saw a, a house that he admired. It was the seat of the clan Douglas. And he, he made a very detailed drawing of that of that house came back to Rochester in, in the middle of 1855 gave that drawing to Merwin Austin Merwin Austin passed it on to his nephew who worked for him his nephew was Andrew Warner Andrew Warner was a draftsman at the time and Andrew Warner uh, drew the working drawings for uh, Warner Castle which which most recently is the home of the, of the Landmark Society of Western New York. I think a very appropriate use for that building. Many years, it was the uh, Garden Center of Rochester, housed uh, the uh, uh, garden, garden clubs. And, 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 and they had a library there. And uh, um, uh, they went out several years ago. Uh, so the county has worked another deal with it. And it ultimately, I think the building belongs to the county. It's, in, it's basically in Highland Park. And uh, the Landmark Society have, has an agreement to occupy it. Uh, good use of that space. Um, and, and we come to Andrew Warner. Andrew Warner is probably the most prolific architect of the late 19th century. Andrew Warner is the designer of our gatehouse at Mount Hope, as you can see here. Uh, a picture taken with a drone, uh, a, an unusual angle for the gatehouse. It's, uh, uh, the style is Victorian Gothic. Victorian Gothic 
is a style of architecture that is heavily dependent on the creativity of the architect. And you can see in our gatehouse, uh, it, has, uh, it, ha it has a big Roman arch over the door. It has some uh, Gothic arches over the, over the, uh, over the uh, windows, over the clear story. Um, it, it, uh, it has uh, 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 polished granite columns. And and it's a sort of a sort of a uh, a, a medley of styles, really. And that was the uh, Victorian Gothic. The one um, the one unifying feature, the one, the thing that that defines the Victorian Gothic style, is uh, uh, what architects call a polychrome exterior. There's a, an older picture of it, a, a polychrome exterior, and that refers to uh, a facade with with different colors and textures. And our gatehouse certainly certainly has that. Uh, um, we have uh, uh, sandstone block walls. We have uh, polished granite columns. We have unpolished granite. Uh, we have a, a, a Medina sandstone water table. That's the base of the building. It's about uh, two and a half feet uh, tall. And it's, it's a very bright red. And uh, so we have this polychrome exterior. The building has a, uh, a bell in the tower that's original to the, uh, to the building. That bell was, uh, was manufactured in Troy, New York by the, by the Manili Bell Company. And they, they were one of the largest bell manufacturers in the, in the country. And uh, we ring that bell all the time. I ring that bell every chance I have when we go to the, when, I, when I'm at the gatehouse, we, every, when we do a tour, on Saturday at 11 o'clock, if I'm there, we ring, we ring that bell 11 times. We rang it for the Fringe Festival event that we just had at, at the cemetery. So in the interior of the gatehouse, uh, on the, on the, uh, to the right uh, is the office, uh, basically the office for the cemetery. On the left was the waiting room. Behind it was the uh, uh, office of the, of the cemetery superintendent. And in down the center of the building, you can see that uh, black and white tiled uh, entry porch. That, that black and white tile used to go from, from this door straight through a hallway that, that bisected the building and, and uh, lined up with the door in the back. Uh, somewhere along the line, uh, they added, they added a, a couple of rooms. And so the porch no, or the, the hallway is no longer there. It ends in the vestibule coming in. But, uh, um, but uh, uh, this building was built during the uh, worst depression the country had ever seen. It, after the panic of 1873, the bottom dropped out of the economy and uh, um, cities like Rochester to put people to work um, they would mount these uh, municipal building projects, and, and the, the gatehouse was one of them. And uh, it's really a pretty fancy building for a, for a make-work project. Um, the interior has, has uh, uh, pretty extensive woodwork. The door and the wainscoting were made of American chestnut and all specifications of Andrew Warner. The ceiling in the uh, cemetery office area uh, it is 16 and a half feet tall. And the building stays uh, relatively comfortable even on, on very hot days. Uh, Andrew Warner was also the architect of the, of the Powers Building downtown. And uh, he is a practitioner of these uh, revival styles that were common in the 19th century. This is the uh, uh, empire, empire style, empire revival style. And uh, uh, it's, one of the features is, is a mansard roof. And, and uh, Andrew Warner got a chance to uh, uh, do this mansard roof uh, three times. The owner of the building, Daniel Powers, uh, really wanted to own the tallest building in Rochester so he would have Warner come back and add to it. So you can see there are uh, the, uh, the first uh, uh, five floors, then there's a mansard uh, uh, on top of that. Uh, that was added, then another mansard on top of that, and a third mansard above that. And then, um, not able to add any more uh, floors like that, uh, he had Warner add a tower to keep his building the tallest one in downtown Rochester. 
Uh, Andrew Warner also designed the city and county hall in, in Buffalo. And uh, it has a lot of the same characteristics as, as our gatehouse. It, it is, uh, in a lot of ways, this, this Victorian Gothic style, although on a massive scale. Those four uh, statues at the, uh, on, the, on the clock tower, to give you some scale, those are 16 feet tall. Each of those is 16 feet tall to give you the scale of the building. And this housed, uh, for a while, it housed both the city and county uh, halls. And uh, eventually, eventually uh, the county added to it, the city built their own city hall. And, uh, but the building still serves as, as a county courthouse and uh, county offices and uh, the more modern building from the 60s behind it is the is the uh, county is the newer county office building in buffalo uh, andrew warner also built the old city hall on broad street once again he's he's employing that uh, victorian gothic style you can see there's uh, uh, smooth uh, uh, sandstone walls at the, at the on the first floor ashler sandstone walls on on the upper floors and uh, um, uh, and, and you know an entrance that incorporates uh, um, several different uh, um, textures. So and this building was built um, to back up to the uh, uh, second county courthouse. There's another view uh, from the 1920s of of, of the, uh, the the old city hall. Andrew Warner uh, designed the first Presbyterian church on, on Plymouth Avenue, directly across from the, from the county complex there in uh, uh, Gothic revival style. But one, you know, once again, he's still, he's still adding those Victorian Gothic features as, as far as the, 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 the uh, uh, facade. But this, is, uh, this, would be, uh, this would be more Gothic revival than Victorian Gothic. And Gothic revival would be uh, would uh, it would be more with the, with the uh, pointed arches and the, uh, the spires and the uh, uh, it's a cruciform uh, church in the, in the shape of a cross in the in, in the back. Uh, there are the two Warners, uh, Andrew Warner on, on the left and his son Jay Foster Warner on the right. And Jay Foster Warner was an architect as well. Jay Foster Warner uh, designed the Granite Building downtown in this Beaux Arts style and he designed the granite building for Sibley Lindsay and Kerr and the first floor first four floors of the granite building were uh, the department stores Sibley Lindsay and Kerr it replaced the Osborne house and, and the other buildings that they were using uh, to house their their operations and uh, uh, Jay Foster Warner also designed the uh, third Munner County Courthouse today uh, it's called the uh, uh, Munner County Office Building on the corner of, of Maine and, and Fitzhugh. Once again, he's, he's using this sort of Beaux-Arts style that's popular in the uh, beginning in the 1880s and 90s and into the, into the first part of the 20th century. Uh, Jay Foster Warner also designed at Mount Hope our, uh, um, our newer chapel, the, one, the 19, 1911 chapel at uh, the south end of the cemetery. And there is uh, uh, an architectural rendering, an architectural rendering of, of, the, of the, the facade of the building uh, uh, done by, by Jay Foster Warner's office. And there's the, the building in the, uh, uh, probably right after it was, uh, right after it was finished. Uh, and this is, this is from, the, from the south side of the building. Uh, to your right in this picture would be Mount Hope Avenue. To the left would be, would be the cemetery road that runs in front of it. Uh, Henry Searle, another architect. Uh, keeping in, keep in mind that all of these architects that we we're talking about, um, um, the, uh, well, um, Alfred Mason Badger, um, Nehemiah Osborne, um, Andrew Warner, and Jay Foster Warner are all buried in Mount Hope Cemetery, and uh, uh, both Warners contributed to the to the uh, uh, buildings in the cemetery. So there's the uh, there's the uh, the 1862 chapel 
at Mount Hope. Henry Searle was the architect for that building. And you see it uh, shortly, uh, well, this, this was probably taken, this, this photograph was probably taken uh, around 1870, in the late 1870s, close to 1875. The, we know that because the, the gazebo, which was built about 1875, still has its original fountain, which, which um, today uh, you might be, uh, you might be horrified to, to learn that that this fountain was sort of a it sort of bubbled and uh, you would uh, there would be a, a, a hooks that had cups on them and you would you would take a cup dip it and and drink from the fountain that way and then re replace the cup and people would you know somebody else would come along and use the same cup um, it was in the 1880s it was replaced by a, a, a more a more modern drinking fountain in a, in a, a very Victorian style, but uh, but you know with a, uh, with a with a little valve on the side where you could you could drink from it like a like a drinking fountain today. But the the chapel is in its original state here with the door in the center. It's uh, it's this very academic uh, Gothic revival style. Once again, one of these revival styles of the of the nineteenth century, and uh, this is how it looked in its original state before the vines grew up and before the uh, later edition. There it is again, a little bit later with the fountain, the 1875 uh, fountain out front. That fountain is cast iron, came from a, a foundry in New York City, the J.L. Mott Foundry, and once again installed in the mid 1870s. But you can see the chapel uh, in its original state. And up at the top of the picture, uh, um, just to the, to the right of the of the side of the chapel, you'll see a, a, a what looks like a monument up on the hill with openings at the top, and that was the vent for the holding vault. And if you went straight in the front door of the chapel and went straight back, uh, you would enter the holding vault, and there was room for um, there's there's uh, I've seen I've seen it written that uh, that they they crammed in uh, more than a hundred uh remains because in, in the winter time in rochester you can't uh dig a grave it's, they're all dug by hand in the 19th century and well into the 20th century so if you had the you know the bad fortune to die in the middle of the winter you you would spend some time in in the holding vault behind behind the chapel and uh there it is so in uh and I don't have a picture of it, I'm sorry to say, but in, in 1911, J. Foster Warner added, put an addition on the chapel to the right of the chapel. He added, he added the crematorium addition uh, and, and it, it became uh, the crematorium facility for the cemetery and it operated until the 1960s. Uh, and uh, the retorts, the old retorts are still there. Retort is a machine that does the cremation. And, uh, and J. Foster Warner did it in exactly the same Gothic revival style that uh, Henry Searle had used when he, uh, when he built the original building. And uh, it fits very nicely. Uh, this is the Third Presbyterian Church, another architect that's buried in Mount Hope, Orlando K. Foote. And, uh, and he designed buildings in a lot of different styles over uh, over a number of years, uh, the uh, um, this the, the Third Presbyterian Church uh, you, you would probably call this um, Richardsonian Romanesque after the architect H.H. Uh, Richardson, the Boston architect, who designed in in this heavy stone style, and uh, um, Orlando K. Foote also designed he designed a number of churches. This is the the in, in a lot of different styles. This is the this is the uh, uh, the Baptist Church on Main Street in Brockport, and in, in a uh, uh, sort of a, a, a more modern Gothic revival. And uh, he designed schools for the city of Canandaigua. This is in, in in the 1880s and 90s. This was one one of the schools, and uh, um, he designed uh, the the, the Congregational Church in Irondequoit. It's now the uh, 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 Irondequoit United United Church of Christ in this colonial revival style. This is Orlando K. Foote, and another school in Canandaigua, 
in, 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 in another style. Um, Orlando K. Foot uh, once again, designed houses all across the region. And, and many of these architects, uh, their uh, signature uh, designs were, um, were these, these public buildings, but they, they, they made uh, a, lot of, a lot of their money designing residences. And uh, uh, there are residences by all of these architects uh, in the city and in the immediate area, but all across the region as well. Um, uh, this is uh, the firehouse, one of the firehouses in Brighton. This is the one that sits on the 12 corners. Looks a little different now, but, but uh, um, there, were, there were four of these. There was one, one on, the four, on the 12 corners. There was one on Blossom Road. There was one on um, uh, East Avenue. Uh, there's a new firehouse there now. And uh, these firehouses were designed by Leon Stern, who was another very prolific architect. Leon Stern uh, uh, designed uh, the Commerce Building that sat on the corner of, of uh, Maine and uh, uh, St. Paul, Maine and South Avenue, where the, where the convention center sits today. I remember watching them implode this building. I think it was 19, 1980, 79 or 80. Uh, they imploded the building, very successfully bringing it down. Um, along with the, uh, there was a, this, this doesn't show it, it's a little slightly later, but right next door to it was a, a, a sort of one of those temple style bank buildings that, uh, occupied by uh, security trust company. That came down too. Uh, Leon Stern, in uh, um, 19, 19, I think that's 1916. He, uh, you know, there's no internet. There's no, um, you know, there, there are limited ways to advertise what you're doing in an effective way. And architects would put these uh, books together. And Leon Stern did that. And, and uh, he would uh, have photographs of, and sometimes drawings of, of his various commissions. And in his case, they were they were pretty extensive. Leon Stern, uh, he he was the, the architect of the old Ruth Kodish uh, uh, synagogue on uh, Grove Street, in this uh, Romanesque style. And I believe they I believe they lost it to a fire. And uh, he, but uh, Leon Stern uh, was a member of of Ruth Kodish of the congregation of Ruth Kodish, and uh, but as it turns out. He was the uh, architect. Uh, he was he was the preferred architect of John Jacob Bausch and Henry Laum, and Leon Stern designed uh, a number of their factory buildings, and uh, uh, John Jacob Bausch and Henry Laum were were Lutherans, and so uh, and uh, John Jacob Bausch was a member of St. Matthew's Lutheran Church on on St. Paul Street. This is this is a picture of it. And uh, so um, they facilitated uh, the commissions for uh, Leon Stern. Leon Stern designed four Lutheran churches in Rochester. This one, another one up on uh, Dewey Avenue that's still there and, and, and two others. And, and uh, Leon Stern, this Jewish architect, he also designed the, the home for the uh, Catholic Bishop of Rochester, Bishop Hickey. And this is, this is the house on East Avenue. The house is still there. Um, he designed a house for uh, John Jacob Bouch. This house is still there, although, although it's hard to see as you go down St. Paul Street because of all the plantings in front of it, but the house is still there. And you can see in this picture, uh, John Jacob Bouch is, uh, looks like a Model T parked in the back by the garage. Where am I here? Um, there are plenty of other architects in, uh, in, in Rochester. Let's get rid of that. Okay. Lots of other architects buried in the cemetery. It would be nearly impossible to, to uh, to cover every one of them. Now, I'll give you a, I'll give you a little, little uh, survey in, in the architects that, that, that I haven't covered so far. Um, in, uh, uh, I believe it's uh, 
it is the uh, one, of, one of the uh, Jewish congregational lots. I think it's Brith Kodesh, is uh, Sigmund Firestone. Sigmund Firestone was an architect, and uh, he was a, a, a immigrant from Romania, and a talented architect and a talented businessman, but also a patron of the arts in general. Sigmund Firestone was the architect of record for the uh, the Monroe County Hospital that that sits out on. Uh, um, East Henrietta Road, across from the uh, across from where Costco is in, in, in that area, and you're, if you're not familiar with that, and uh, Sigmund Firestone uh, hired a, a young architect named Thomas Boyd. Thomas Boyd applied for the job. Sigmund Firestone's office had advertised for an architect to work on the, the county hospital project, and uh, Thomas Boyd applied for the job. When he showed up in the office. The secretary pointed out to him that he was a black man, that he was a Negro in her terms, and uh, um, and uh, but despite despite maybe her misgivings, this is the 1920s. Um, Sigmund Firestone came out. He interviewed Thomas Boyd, and Thomas Boyd, uh, you know, once again, Sigmund Firestone uh, noted that he didn't realize that, that Thomas Boyd was, was a Negro, as he put it. And Thomas Boyd said, uh, well, you, you advertise for an architect and I'm an architect. And Sigmund Firestone hired him to, uh, to do the uh, design work for the facade and, and much of the uh, work at the, at the Monroe County Hospital. And uh, by all accounts, the hospital is, uh, is still very functional based on the, on the, uh, the design work of, of Sigmund Firestone and Thomas Boyd. Thomas Boyd is uh, buried in Mount Hope. He died in 1981, and uh, uh, once again, did he was very prolific. And, and one of the one of the he did a lot of um, work that he was not necessarily cited for through his life uh, in a big way. He designed a lot of. Uh, shopping closets and, and uh, commercial buildings and things like that. And, uh, but he, he, his, I think his big claim to fame, Thomas Boyd, was that he designed a, 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 a large number of uh, mid-century modern homes. I, I, I got in trouble one time because I discovered a, online a, a, a list of Thomas Boyd's commissions. So my trip home from, from, from you know, the university which usually takes about 20 minutes, uh, took about three and a half hours because I, I went around and looked at all of these Thomas Boyd uh, mid-century modern houses that, that were on this list. And, there, and, and when you went to these places, you really could see that there was something different about these houses that uh, uh, made them stand out from the other houses in the neighborhood. Some of the neighborhoods were you know, uh, um, pretty upscale. But uh, but these Thomas Boyd houses held their own and and had a had a very distinctive look to them. He used he would put uh, he would have windows meet at the corners of the house sometimes and and minimize the uh, 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 the transition in the interiors. Of course, I didn't see the interiors, but he he did something that he referred to as May West walls. He would put these curved walls in in, in the interior of the house. And so, uh, so the interiors were were unique, and uh, uh, and these houses there are probably probably three or four hundred of these houses throughout uh, Rochester and the surrounding area, and uh, um, interesting homes. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, um, Leon Stern's Leon Stern's cousin. Herbert Stern, who's another architect in town. Herbert Stern, also buried in Mount Hope. Uh, Herbert Stern has a mausoleum on Grove Avenue. And uh, he, he tended to design, uh, a, once again, a lot of uh, private homes, but he liked the English Regency style. And there's a house on East Avenue in the English Regency style that he designed for his uh, parents, apparently. And uh, um, uh, Richard Reeson told a story one time that he, he admired that house for a long time. And uh, um, while well, Herbert Stern was still alive and he met Herbert Stern and, and told him that. And Herbert Stern said, oh, well, you know, you wouldn't like it. It, it really only, is, only has like one bedroom. It's an enormous house and it has one bedroom, but it has many other rooms that could have potentially been used for, 
for, for bedrooms because it had servants' rooms and all sorts of things throughout the house. But but uh, but Herbert Stern saw it as a as a, a one bedroom house. Um, and uh, uh, lots of lots of architectural uh, clients in, in, in Mount Hope. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, designed uh, the Boynton House on East Boulevard. And the Boyntons are buried in the cemetery. And uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, came to Rochester. Uh, this is the, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the his most Eastern uh, prairie house design, the house, the Boynton House on East Boulevard. And uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, was, uh, was a genius. He was ahead of his time uh, as far as the, uh, the building technology. And uh, many times his, uh, his buildings were, were uh, um, influential and unique and, and, and had a, a, a beauty to them. And, and he was concerned about fitting them into the site hard thing to do on, a, on, a, on an elongated lot on, on East Boulevard, but, but he did a fairly good job with that. And, uh, um, but uh, his clients tended to uh, uh, have issues with him. Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, he, his estimates for what these houses would cost was always a fraction of what they actually cost. And his clients would complain about that and the Boynton's complained about that as well. And he, he used, uh, he used flat roofs on a lot of his houses, and uh, and a lot of his roofs leaked. There was a, a story about uh, Her Herbert Johnson, the uh, uh, head of uh, Johnson Wax. Uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright built the Johnson Wax Administration Building, which is a beautiful, beautiful building. It's one of his iconic buildings. And Herbert Johnson had him uh, design a house for it in Racine, Wisconsin, and uh, he called it Wing Spread. And uh, Herbert Johnson, uh, after after uh, shortly after after the house was uh, he, he occupied the house, he had a he had a big party, and he's sitting at this long dinner table, and uh, there's water dripping on his head, and uh, his, the roof is leaking, and the house is is practically new, so he called Frank Lloyd right on the phone, and Frank Lloyd he said he told him that that. Um, he's sitting there, and that that it that the rain is dripping on his head. And Frank Lloyd's right. Frank Lloyd Wright's answer was, "I'd advise you to move your chair." And then he hung up. And that that's uh, um, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, thought, uh, clearly thought he was doing his clients a favor by designing these buildings for them. Uh, uh, but uh, you know. An iconic architect in America, and we're lucky in Rochester to have one of those Frank Lloyd Wright houses here. There are a number of them in Buffalo. Uh, um, Frank Lloyd Wright designed the, the Martin House in Buffalo, and uh, it sits on a five-acre site with, you know, another house next to it designed by Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, and and several outbuildings. And that's been uh, restored over the last uh, fifteen years to the tune of, I think, about $55 million. And uh, you can go, go tour the Martin House in Buffalo and get an idea of, of what it looked like in, in uh, the very early 1900s when he, when he designed it. Um, so, so for me, um, architecture is, uh, is the art that you see every day. And, uh, um, you know, people have described architecture in a lot of different ways. Uh, uh, the German poet uh, Goethe said that architecture was frozen music. Once again, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, quoted Goethe a number of times, and eventually, he eventually started saying that as if he had made it up. Uh, uh, but uh, I kind of get it, you know. Uh, and uh, for me, um, architecture, landscape architecture, and the built environment is uh, really the best art museum that you could imagine. And uh, I frequently take, take different routes home and take different routes to get places specifically to enjoy that architecture. So uh, I would uh, encourage you to take a second look. There were uh, some uh, writers in the mid 20th century, uh, 
uh, John Brinkerhoff Jackson and uh, John Stilgo, who wrote about just that sort of thing. That, you know, uh, how much you could learn from just being aware and, and looking at your surroundings and, and asking the question, why? Why did these things develop the way they, they did? And, and I think uh, that's a, a great way to approach architecture and architectural history. And once again, there is uh, no better place to do that than, than in Mount Hope Cemetery, where um, you will see um, every architectural style from the early 19th century to the present. Uh, the most recent um, mausoleum in Mount Hope is in the form of a pyramid and uh, done in a uh, sort of, uh, um, I think, an updated style. It's done in, in a, a material called rainbow granite, uh, which is unique, only found in one place in the United States in, uh, in uh, Minnesota, shipped here. And, uh, and the, the site and the, the mausoleum itself, um, if you go to Mount Hope and see it, uh, that's what $1.5 million will get you. Uh, upon your death. Uh, Clifford Davy, who had it built, is still with us and uh, um, will someday occupy it, but, uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a unique thing. And uh, municipal cemeteries are the only cemeteries in New York where those private mausoleums are allowed to be built because the state has outlawed them in private cemeteries because um, there have been many examples over the years where they've been, where the cemetery has uh, gone bankrupt and the municipality gets gets stuck maintaining these uh, very expensive to maintain mausoleums. So uh, um, we may see we may see more of them along the way. Um, the cemetery itself, uh, the architect that I left out of all of this, and maybe maybe the most important architect in all of this is, is a man named John Rochester Thomas. And and uh, He's buried under a, a very small monument. Uh, and you would, you know, if you were searching for him and you didn't know where, he, where his grave was, you wouldn't, you wouldn't accidentally come across it. But John Rochester Thomas, he died in, he died in 1901. The American Institute of Architects uh, said at the time that, that he was the most prolific architect in the United States. He was designing, uh, all kinds of projects uh, uh, throughout the country. Uh, John Rochester Thomas uh, designed in Rochester, he designed the uh, Deland Chemical Buildings in Fairport, designed the first Baptist church in, in Fairport on the corner there, that big red uh, Gothic, uh, uh, Victorian Gothic uh, church. Across the street, he designed a house for Henry Deland, a house that they now call the Green Lantern, it's a restaurant party house. Um, he designed uh, houses throughout uh, throughout the city, um, and uh, he was as he was as much a businessman as he was an architect. And he, he always found a uh, uh, found an opportunity where, where they where they were, and uh, um, he he designed some churches. He designed a few Baptist churches, and then. Um, uh, he got the, the, the American Baptist Church to recommend him as an architect for, for the building of Baptist churches. So, so he, he designed 159 Baptist churches across the country for the American Baptist churches. And uh, it, he, he won a design competition uh, to design, uh, it, was, it was very well connected politically to designed um, um, Elmira Prison. It, it was the Elmira Reformatory, and it was a new idea in 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 um, in corrections. You know, Auburn was uh, Auburn was a prison. You were given a, a bed, a Bible, and and that you were expected to work. Uh, there was a lot of regimentation at Elmira. They were there was a lot of that, but they were trying to uh, recognize that uh, the prisoner needed to be rehabilitated. And there was a lot more emphasis on rehabilitation and the prison architecture at Elmira reflected that. And uh, um, John Rochester Thomas uh, uh, actually, actually wrote a, a small book about, about prison uh, architecture design and published it. And, and in the process became 
uh, the go-to architect for prison design all across the country. Uh, if you didn't hire him to design your prison, you would hire you would you would use his his design principles to design the prison in your in your state or in your your county, and it designed many prisons across across the United States. Uh, designed uh, houses in Rochester. Uh, there's a house. There's a house on uh, um, Prince Street in, in a, sort of a carpenter Gothic style, big, big uh, stick style, basically house. And he designed that. Um, designed houses for uh, many of the wealthy throughout that East Avenue Park Avenue area, and. Uh, buried in the cemetery. And I, I always think of him as, as the most famous person buried in the cemetery that no one has ever heard of. And, uh, and truly, he, his, his uh, most high profile design was in New York City. Uh, John Rochester Thomas entered a design competition to design a new city hall for New York City. And uh, uh, out of 300 submissions, he won the design competition to the to the you know ire of uh, Tammany Hall, who had their own ar architect in mind for that for that job, and uh, so they 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 uh, lobbied and engineered uh, a system where where the city hall would not be built, and the, the, you know they're still occupying the city hall that was that, that they occupied before this design competition in the 1890s. But uh, John Rochester Thomas's building was built. Uh, it was built by the city as their hall of records. And it's in the Beaux-Arts style, this, this style that comes from uh, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in, in Paris. And, uh, um, and uh, there's some great pictures of it online. I'm sorry I didn't, didn't include that, uh, but uh, um, today it's the home of the, it's, it's the, uh, it houses the uh, New York surrogates court. It's still, still operating and uh, the interior of the building is, uh, is beautiful. Uh, John Rochester Thomas was, was uh, not only a great designer, but he was a great engineer in the process. He designed uh, some armory buildings in New York uh, that uh, um, nobody thought, uh, nobody thought what he did could be done. Um, he had, uh, you know, they would, the first floor in most armories would be the, the parade floor and they would do their, their uh, drilling on the first floor. But the second floor, um, you, needed, you needed columns, you know, if, if you're gonna have it, uh, this open parade floor, the first floor, you, you couldn't put columns there. So the second floor couldn't hold a lot of weight. Well, uh, John Rochester Thomas uh, found a, a solution for that. So he, he built these armories in New York, where you could uh, you could put uh, um, uh, uh, artillery and 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 a huge crowds and, and and huge amounts of weight on the second floor without encumbering the first floor with a bunch of columns, and uh, those buildings are still in use today. So he moved to John Rochester Thomas moved to New York City in in about 1882 because that's where his commissions were coming from at that time. Uh, but he, uh, his parents were buried here. His parents had come from England. His family was buried here. And when he died in 1901, he, uh, uh, he, he had wanted to be buried in the family plot, and he was. Um, he died at his daughter's summer home in, uh, on Wellesley Island in the Thousand Islands in, in 1901 of a heart attack, a sudden uh, massive heart attack at a fairly young age, but uh, um, he is uh, um, highly thought of, in, not just in Rochester, but across across the country for all of these these uh, various designs of his um, that uh, that he did. And uh, um, lots of lots of just plain builders in Rochester who 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 designed what what uh, architectural historians would, would refer to as vernacular architecture. I took a course in vernacular architecture about 15 years ago on the river campus at the U of R. And the, uh, the professor's name was Joan Saab. She's a dean today. And uh, the first assignment uh, that she gave us was to write a, a short paper 
um, on uh, to walk through Mount Hope Cemetery and write a short paper about our impressions and, and what we we saw because part of the course was to to develop a, a, a way of looking at, at this vernacular architecture. And of course, uh, at this point, I'd been doing the tour and been involved in the cemetery for about 30 years. I thought I had hit the lottery. And I did, I got an A plus on the paper. But uh, I think she was kind of scratching her head as to uh, how I knew so much about Mount Hope Cemetery, but uh, she, she later found out. But uh, um, if you, uh, your, your next travel, your next travel through the city, I, I, I think you should, uh, Look around you. Take a second look at the buildings and the, the uh, uh, things that you see, because uh, uh, you can learn a lot about about people by just looking around. Um, and then that would be that would be my charge to you after today. Anybody have any questions? Well, thank you, Dennis. Uh, we have a couple of comments in the chat. I can start by reading them and seeing if you have a response to this. Sure. Uh, the first is from Maureen. Uh, the Greece Historical Society has commissioned a study of Boyd's work and is compiling a study, <clears throat> further study of his work. Um, do you have anything additional to say about Boyd? Or are uh, you familiar with the work that they're doing? I, I, I was uh, um, delighted to hear that when they, when they began that study. And uh, um, I know Gina DeBella up there is, is involved in that. And I, I know Gina and uh, um, it, it's in good hands with, with them. And uh, there are a number of, of Boyd houses in, in Greece. I mean, there, there, there's at least one very, very uh, important one along um, Beach Avenue, uh, just into the town of Greece. And uh, um, I, I, I'm anxiously awaiting the results of that uh, of that project uh, because I think Boyd was was maybe one of the most important uh, uh, architects uh, in Rochester over over the course of the last 200 years. Certainly, um, certainly one of the uh, one of the iconic residential architects in Rochester, and uh, and he did it under you know under um, great burden. You know, in his day, so uh, um, there were there are lots of Thomas Boyd uh, uh, buildings where um, he was not able to be credited as the architect of record because of race. So I'm happy to see uh, see him get the, the his the credit that he's due. Thomas Boyd is buried in an unmarked grave in in, in Mount Hope Cemetery, and uh, um, and that. You know, there are lots of reasons why people end up in with with no monument. We think about twenty percent of the uh, of the graves in Mount Hope are unmarked. So, uh, you know, I, I I wouldn't venture a guess as to why Boyd's grave is, is not marked. But uh, but uh, for me, that's a that's a kind of a tragedy because I think he is an important uh, um, an important uh, individual in the history of of our community certainly left a, an important legacy in, in, in his buildings. Absolutely. Uh, Marjorie Searle makes a comment, a 20th century architect and perhaps the first solar architect in Rochester, first female architect in Rochester, Martha Gates is buried mm -hmm. with her husband, chemistry professor at UR in Mount Hope. Her work was nearly exclusively residential. Do you have anything to say about her work? Um, and, and uh, I, I, I need to get with Marjorie and she, she can tell me all about it because she apparently knows a lot more about it than I do. <laughs> Martha, am I, her, am I uh, heard? Can you hear me, Dennis? Yes, yes, I can oh, hear Okay, you. well, I have a little bit of an advantage. Uh, her daughter is my uh, sister-in-law. <laughs> well, yeah, all right. So <laughs> don't feel bad. Um, <laughs> but she is not well known and uh, nor well, very well recognized before she died she did receive an honor from the local aia which was very nice um but it was a, it's a hard field for a woman her daughter incidentally became the uh, part owner of barrow architecture so continuing the family tradition but um dennis you did a really lovely job and i learned a lot and i want to say thank you for this and i know 
from personal experience how much what a font of knowledge you are and it's you. always a pleasure to uh, learn more from you thank you thank you uh, I, I know that uh, uh, female architects up until probably the last uh, 30 or 40 years uh, many times uh, were not uh, given the credit that they they deserved um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright had a, 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 a female uh, apprentice in Oak Park and uh, um, and she married another architect and uh, uh, whose both names escape me at the moment but but her husband went on to uh, be credited with designing the capital at Canberra in Australia and it and, and really it was his wife that did most of the work and and she was a, a um, she was a, a very talented she, at, at, at the renderings. She, most of what Frank Lloyd Wright built in, in the Prairie style when he worked in Oak Park, the renderings were, uh, were, were by, by this female apprentice. And she was a, a, as competent and maybe more competent an architect than most of the other people that, that were designing in that style during that time. So uh, uh, yeah, in Buffalo we have there's there's an architect uh, who designed uh, a lot of uh, public buildings, designed the Lafayette Hotel. Uh, her name is uh, once again I'm blanking Bethune I think, and uh, um, but uh, in Buffalo this sort of uh, you know if, if you want to if you want to see great architecture. And, and see uh, the architecture of virtually every great architect in, in America go to Buffalo because, because it's, it's there. And, and, but she, in Buffalo, she's given the credit that she deserves. And, uh, um, but that, that hasn't always been the case with, with female architects. They would be, uh, um, they would do a lot of that work you would never hear from them. They would never be the architect of record. There were some women that had, uh, their own uh, architectural practices, and and uh, mostly they were doing uh, residential architecture. They might uh, they might get commissions from uh, builders who were who were building subdivisions, but they would never be really credited for the work that they did. And that that certainly we're correcting that these days. And 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 Marjorie, by the time I do this again. I, I certainly will include uh, um, include the architect that you, you just spoke of. So, um, yeah. Excellent. So there are several thank yous in here. I think the, the one that I want to point out is thank you. I will take a second look as I drive about. Um, and that leads to actually a question from me. I'm gonna throw in before we move on to others. Um, people talk, you talked about vernacular architecture, the value of looking around as you drive about. Um, <clears throat> for me, I've spent a lot of the pandemic when I wanted to get out of the house doing that, teaching myself vernacular architecture. Yeah. Just to mention it, the book that was most valuable to me was Virginia McAllister's Field Guide to American Houses. Um, are there any books besides that classic that you would recommend people learn, look at uh, for learning vernacular architecture? There's uh, this book. Uh, it's, uh, this book's been around for a lot of years. Identifying an American Architecture, and it's still available at uh, Barnes and Noble and places like that. And I've I've used this quite often, and I've used the McAllister book. I have that on my shelf. Um, there are some uh, there are some books uh, specific to Rochester. Of course, Richard Reeson's uh, uh, book about uh, two hundred years of Rochester architecture and gardens. There's this book this book from the seventies, uh, Landmarks of Rochester and Monroe County. Um, this is sort of hard to find, uh, but uh, there are used copies of it around, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully, it won't cost a fortune to to get them. But uh, but the libraries, the libraries have this. But this is a this is a great book uh, to have. Uh, we have well, copies here in local history. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. And uh, um, there are a couple of other books. A couple of other books that I, I have used or that I, I, I find useful. This one, uh, Master Builders. It's this sort of you know elongated book. And this one is this one is still available. And another one in the same series. What style is it? 
And that's sort of an interesting uh, thing to carry around if you, uh, you know, initially, if you don't know what, what some of these styles are. And there are some styles listed in here that, uh, that you wouldn't necessarily uh, know casually. So it's a, it's a useful, useful book in that respect. And uh, um, there are lots of things online, of course, today that, uh, that weren't online, you know, a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, they're constantly um, um, digitizing things. And that's, that's good uh, for anything that's a little bit older. Uh, another thing that I, another thing that I uh, have used is the Historic American Building Survey. Uh, this this uh, um, uh, Depression era project, and they, they, they did a lot of documenting buildings that some of them are no longer with us. But they 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 sent these uh, architects out um, and made uh, made drawings of these and and uh, documented uh, the buildings and tried to find out who who the designers were and uh, the history of these buildings and there's a there's a treasure trove of information in in the historic American Building Survey and then the uh, the subsequent this is this is uh, maintained by the Park Service and uh, subsequent to that. Uh, there is the uh, historic, uh, I'm not 100% sure what the exact title is, but there's the historic um, engineering uh, survey as well. And that has things like bridges and all kinds of things that wouldn't neatly fall into the architectural category. Once again, uh, a treasure trove of information. And, uh, um, you know, if you're visiting another city, I think a great place to start is the cemetery. You know, see lots of things that uh, will uh, maybe uh, point you in the direction to look at buildings and, and uh, structures and all sorts of things. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I, in addition to the pure architecture, I, I, I'm very interested in landscape architecture. I always compare landscape, the, the landscape architect that designs parks and large uh, uh, landscapes. I, you know, um, I think the, uh, the architect is to Fred Astaire what uh, the landscape architect is to Ginger Rogers. Ginger Rogers was interviewed in the 60s and, she's, and they're, they're, they're asking her all these questions about how great it was to dance with Fred Astaire. And she said, well, yeah, I did the same thing. But I did it backwards and in heels, and and that sort of uh, that sort of uh, gives you an idea of the landscape architect's job. They not only the, the, the they're not just building a building that sits someplace. Some architects are more concerned about their site than others, but they still the building is the building. When you're done, it's complete. The landscape architect has to take into consideration what this is going to look like a year from now, five years from now, twenty years from now. 50 years from now. And, uh, and that's why we revere Frederick Law Olmsted because he had, he had a, a sense for that. And, and if you go to Central Park or to some of the Rochester parks or all of the Buffalo parks, you'll see that uh, handiwork. And uh, a lot of those sight lines and vistas and things that he designed are still effective today. Uh, it, it didn't just happen. He, um, these parks were 100% design spaces. And, uh, and you see the benefit of, you know, you see the benefit of that competent design. So um, I, I have a great appreciation for um, architectural history, architectural design, and landscape design. I do want to follow up on a couple of things you mentioned there with the Historic American Building Survey and the Historic American Engineering Survey, which is a really overlooked resource. Um, if anyone's looking for them, both of them are available in their complete form through the Library of Congress. Um, yeah. We use them as a reference here at the library all the time. Uh, we also happen to have periods of 1930s, 1940s physical prints of all of the Rochester uh, Historic American Building Survey uh, surveys. Yeah, these, uh, you know, um, in a lot of cases, when you when you look at some of these things, you can sort of discern a narrative in in, in the built environment. And I'll give you a good example. We have a, a mausoleum in Mount Hope. Uh, it's the uh, um, uh, 
uh, it's an Osolino boat, basically it was a wholesale grocer. Um, uh, it's it's uh, Edgar Curtis, Curtis Burns is the company that, that, that he and his brother founded. And uh, Edgar Curtis has this mausoleum in the cemetery and uh, it was built in 1906. And it's uh, sort of a, you know, sort of a, a, a design that uh, maybe um, in, a, in, a, in a more architectural way, it's maybe how your it's maybe how your grandmother would put together her living room if she if she didn't you know as things happen you know and uh, uh, the Curtis Mausoleum is uh, it has a basic Egyptian style it has the battered walls the, the sloping walls on the outside but then it has a, a big Roman arch over the door it has um, um, uh, columns that are of a totally different uh, um, Byzantine capitals on the columns. And it has other, um, basically what Frank Lloyd Wright would have, would have called applied decoration. And, uh, and you know, when I look at that over time, I, I've, I've kind of developed this narrative in my head about how that happened. It was designed, it was built by a company called Leland Weston and Lowe, who were on Mount Hope Avenue directly across from the cemetery, right about where the distillery is today. And they built um, they built uh, a lot of high-end mausoleums, uh, monuments, things like that. More so, more, more things also outside of the cemetery, you know, public public art monuments and things like that. But uh, I I think I have a theory about about this mausoleum. In 1889, Louis Sullivan uh, built the Ryerson tomb in Graceland Cemetery in Chicago, and in uh, uh, 1892, uh, there was an article in the architectural record with, with pictures of the Ryerson tomb. And the Ryerson tomb is a, uh, a very modernist uh, take on the Egyptian revival. It, it's polished black granite. Um, it's, it's very stylistically uh, consistent and uh, it's unique for its time, uh, which was 1889. And I, my theory is that uh, uh, Leland Weston and Lowe, one of those guys was actually an architect and I'm, I, I'm not sure which one, but, uh, and then I think they also used, um, I, I think they also contracted with architects in town, probably guys that were retired. And whoever did that, uh, that Curtis Mausoleum uh, used, you know, three or four different revival style elements on this one mausoleum. And I think they got the I think they got the basic idea because they read the architectural record and they read about the Ryerson tomb. But their take on it is is a total mishmash compared to Louis Sullivan's take on that on that uh, stylized Egyptian revival. So you know you can learn a lot about people by just just looking at the built environment. Absolutely. Speaking of people, uh, Marjorie Searle makes a comment about people who preserve our architectural heritage here that I think is worth reading, um, paying tribute to a couple of folks along with you, Dennis, um, just so everyone knows. Um, Cynthia Hauk, who is newly retired from Landmark Society's A Treasure Trove mm -hmm. on Architecture, and a shout out to the wonderful Jean France of Blessed Memory, whose life was architecture. She follows that with, we are so fortunate to have people like Dennis who are so dedicated to our treasures. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Well, if not, thank you all for coming today and joining us for today's presentation. Again, I hope to see you in November on November 12th uh, for Rose's presentation, which will conclude the series for 2022. Thank you all and have a good day. Bye-bye.